About a year after Compaq introduced the 386 processor to the PC, Tandy released their own with the Tandy 4000. Seen here is a page from Tandy's catalog. The case styling was borrowed from the previous year's 286 powered 3000. You'd be hard pressed to pick it out of a lineup. Let's look around. On the back, it's identified as a 25-5000A. The A was added after the initial launch to indicate the switch from a 287 to a 387 coprocessor, since the 387 was not available until two years after the release of the 386. The bottom case, in case anyone's interested, the back view shows 10 expansion slots, however, the motherboard only has 9 connectors. Inside the cover is a stamp. I didn't find anything online matching it. Once the cover's off, we find room for 3 half-life drives, a 192 watt power supply, and connectors for 9, not 10 add-in cards. The cards from left to right, a proprietary memory card with two megs, a serial and parallel card, a 2400 baud modem, catalog number 25-1034, at almost $500, that's what I paid for my first car. A Western Digital VGA card and an Adaptec AHA 1542A SCSI host controller. The drive bays were filled with a three and a half inch floppy and a five and a quarter inch carrier, a quarter inch cassette tape backup, and an 84 meg SCSI hard drive. Let's zoom in for a closer look. The case is over 18 inches wide with the motherboard occupying 11 inches of it. And the case and motherboard are over 16 inches deep. From the top, 6 16-bit, 2 8-bit, and the proprietary 32-bit memory slot. The CPU. A close-up shows the double Sigma stamp. Early units had a math bug that showed up in 32-bit mode. Intel tested these and if it passed was stamped with the double Sigma, else it was stamped with 16-bit software only. Some silk screening on the motherboard if you're interested. 8 256K SIMs with three hidden beneath the card guide for an onboard total of two megs. That would be a grand total of four megs once the memory card was installed. This is four of the eight ICs that make up the chips and technologies chipset and the two EPROMs for the Phoenix BIOS. Over time, all the ICs needed to make a compatible system were included in more and more integrated packages until almost everything was in one large chip. Seen here is the 8042 microcontroller used by IBM AT and clones as a keyboard controller. The empty socket is for the 387 math coprocessor. Most if not all manufacturers provided a socket for a 287 coprocessor until the 387 came to market. This is a screenshot of PC config. And here it is all cleaned up and ready for business. From day one, this box had issues. The power supply would only blink before shutdown. 
I pulled everything out of the chassis except the motherboard, but still no go. With it disconnected, the supply did power on, so I checked for shorts between the motherboard's power connector pins and ground, but still no luck. There was one capacitor that had blown its top, but it didn't seem to be the problem. I replaced it for good measure. So into the supply I poked. Fishing around online, I found a schematic that was surprisingly close. I pulled a few component legs loose to check values. Never did find one that was really bad, but I replaced some capacitors anyway. Plugged it back in, and what do you know, now it works. Was it a marginal component? A bad solder joint? A loose piece of something conductive wedged somewhere on the motherboard that fell off with all the handling it received? One for the books, I guess. At last, I was elated to hear the familiar beep during the post. My spirits were tempered by the next hurdle. Seems the original floppy drive was not going to cooperate. Substitution time. Easy enough. The ribbon cable did not carry the power to the drive, unlike many other Tandys, and it worked correctly with a new cable with the drive twist. Next problem, plug in a keyboard. Next was a SCSI card and original drive. Powering on, there was no sound from the drive. I waited until I was sure the card had sent the command to start the motor. It's a scuzzy thing. So a quick twist and the spindle roared to life, but it was not to be. I tried several times, each with the same results. Target has a fault. Again, substitution time. Out with the Quantum, in with a Seagate ST2383N. Three problems down, now on to setup. Since Tandy omitted a built-in setup program, it has to be run from a diskette. Answer a few questions, press any key to reboot, and the invalid configuration message returned. I know, dead battery, duh. New battery, check. Run setup, check. Reboot, check. Error message, yep, still there. Time to fast forward a bit. Many hours scouring the web, tried 3 volt, 4.5, and 6 volt batteries, rebooted maybe a hundred times, you set up from other Tandys, from other manufacturers, and generic ones. <sighs> maybe it's a hardware problem. I noticed the date on the chip that contains the RTC and its memory was different from the rest. Maybe this problem has been tackled before. Amazingly, this chip is still out there and costs less than $10 shipped. In a few days, I had a new one in hand. Popped it in, crossed my fingers, and invalid configuration. I put it aside for a while. I was feeling burnt out. Over the next few weeks, I had started kicking around a few ideas. First, debug. I stepped through the RTC memory one byte at a time writing down each and decoding the equipment list and status bits. I ran setup, repeated with the bug, ran a different setup, repeated with the bug. I started just setting the bytes with the bug instead of setup. Then rebooting. I rebooted from the bug with a jump, with a call, from the keyboard, and with the reset button. I had another idea. I had a cheesy two-digit diagnostic card. I plugged it in and rebooted. It displayed numeric codes starting from 1 to 3E, but cleared after the post was done. No discernible problem there. Next, I burnt my debug code with some slight rework to an EEPROM, placed it on an old network card, and powered the computer on. After post, but before booting, the firmware read each byte of RTC memory and displayed it on the diagnostic card. Again, I recorded and decoded each byte. I ran setup, changed every field randomly, rebooted, repeated, repeated. Like a rush, I spotted a pattern. Most of the bytes would be scrambled, random, meaningless, causing the post to warn of invalid configuration, except for one. 
the video would always be set at 80 column in color, even though it should be none, or like others, random. None indicates a card with its own BIOS, such as an EGA or VGA. I quickly substituted another card. There's nothing like the satisfaction of moving past a particularly stubborn problem. Why would the video card cause the configuration, time, and date to go crazy? I'll test the video card on some other computer in the future. After addressing a few loose ends and some fitment issues, final assembly was completed and it joined my modest vintage collection.